Well, good morning. Glad you could be here this morning, and uh, we are going to spend some time worshiping the Lord uh, in whatever way we can. Even if we can't sing, we're going to worship the Lord. You know that we had a a great time last Sunday. Um, for those of you that weren't here, but for those of you that were here, it was just a great, uh, great time in God's presence. So uh, we're going to continue to do that. Uh, the worship team is going to play and encourage you to, to uh, praise the Lord in whichever way you can. Just remember, we're not allowed to sing, so we won't sing. But we can, we can speak to the Lord. We can, we can pray. We can stand up and raise our hands and worship the Lord in that way. Um, and so I just encourage you to do that. We'll come back in a little bit uh, and do some responsive reading. And then Pastor Steve will be preaching this morning. So... Um, I get, a, I get a Sunday off, kind of. I don't know if that's really off, but, you know, it's kind of nice. Um, but why don't we pray? Father, we thank you that, Lord, we can come into this place and gather together. Lord, and we can worship you. Lord, sometimes we get so caught up in what we think worship is, but worship really is glorifying you. And so, Lord, we're going to glorify you. We're going to honor you. We're going to bow before you with a heart that is honoring you. And, Lord, as we move forward, as, uh, as we spend time today together, may your presence be so real in this place. And, Lord, may we just encounter your presence today. Lord, as we worship you, as we bow before you, Father, we thank you for this place. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was reminded this week that worship is not just about singing. Pastor Mark and I have been chatting a bit about this at home, going, well, how do we worship if we can't use our voices? But God gave us an entire body to be able to worship him with, right? We can choose to meditate on his word, to meditate on his words that he's spoken to us in the Bible. We can choose to lift our hands. We can choose to clap our hands. We can choose to recite psalms to worship him with our words. So as we play this morning, um, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth.
Yes, Lord God. Father, we just want to give you honor and glory and praise. The word says that they cry out in the in heaven, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to be. Lord, we, we cry out to you, holy, 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 for Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Lord, we praise you today. We praise you today, O oh God. Lord, we thank you for those that have served our community for these numbers of months now. Lord, we, we think of those in the grocery store and the stores who have served us, who have made it available for us to be able to get the essential things we've needed. And Lord, as things have opened up and others have stepped into that realm of serving us in our community, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I think of our hospital staff and, and our medical staff who have, have worked so hard to serve this community in a time that is difficult. Lord, in a time when it, doing their job was difficult to begin with, but to do it under these circumstances, Lord, and under the restrictions and the challenges they faced, uh, Lord, we just thank you for them. Pray your blessing on their homes and on their families and, Lord, on their own mental health. Lord, the struggle that they face uh, having to deal with this day in and day out. So, Lord, I, I pray that you would strengthen them today. And, Father, I think of our, our first responders, those that uh, really have not had the opportunity even to step away from what they do. They are still there serving our community. And so, Lord, we thank you for that, and we pray your blessing on them. And for, Lord, our, our leaders in this country, those that are determining things at the, at the health units, Lord, I pray that you would uh, give them, continue to give them wisdom. Lord, that they would see things from, uh, Lord, not out of fear or worry, but Lord, from a logical, common sense, practical way of serving uh, and Lord, helping us to understand what they're doing and why. And Father, as we gather together, we think of those that aren't able to be here, Lord, at home, and we just pray that you would uh, encourage them today, encourage the, the word today, that they would hear your word and be challenged and, and encouraged. And Lord, we thank you for today, and we give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, last week we we uh, we did some res res responsive reading, and so we thought we would carry that on this week. And and uh, so this is the the passage that um, I thought was kind of fitting. Uh, you know, sometimes we're challenged with um, everything in life, and. Uh, but we need to know that God is there in the midst of it all. So uh, if you'll read the yellow, I'll do my best to read the white. And uh, hopefully uh, we can all get through it without stumbling too much. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Is it God who justifies? Who 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love of Christ, you cannot be separated from it. Think about that, folks. He loves you that much. He loves you that much. You can't be separated from it. You can't be kept back from his love. And uh, would you, uh, why don't you welcome Pastor Steve? I know uh, we don't do that very often, but let's welcome Pastor Steve as he comes to preach this morning. Pastor Bob has been the one who's been saying that he feels like a televangelist these days, being on uh, TV so much, but uh, thank you for that warm welcome. It is kind of strange to, to be in front of you all and actually be able to look you in the eye and say, you know, welcome, or it's nice to see you and actually see people. Um, for weeks on end, we had the camera right here, and you're, you're talking to a piece of plastic and glass, and you're thinking... I hope somebody's looking back through that little tiny lens, and, uh, but it's really, really good to see you this morning. Um, if you were with us online several uh, weeks ago in the evening, I did start on this series called Mindset, so if you uh, didn't watch it, and I know that not all of you watched it, because I have uh, statistics on YouTube that tell me that there's not enough people that watched it in this room. So, if you want to catch up, there is the ability you can watch it on our website. And uh, if you've never visited our website before, I uh, encourage you to do that. There's always information on there. Yes? Do you remember when that was that you? Uh, that would have been probably about, I'd say, a month. And if, if people go to yeah. Yeah, the thumbnail will be on, the, on there. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to continue that here um, this morning. But before we do, uh, we're just going to pray. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you, Lord, and though I'm finding it extremely difficult not to sing, it is just part of who I have been made. And uh, Lord, though we are... Uh, challenged in many ways. You are still on the throne. You still know what you're doing. None of this has caught you off guard. There's nothing in this whole mix that you don't know of and you don't already know how to get through it. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the challenges because it draws us close to you. We thank you for, for those times uh, of, of difficulty because, Lord, we, we tend to lean in on you. And so, Lord, as we lean in this morning, as we want to hear from your word and hear from your Holy Spirit, we thank you for being in this room. We thank you for being part of our lives. We thank you that, that as we call out to you, you are there and attentive and hear our cries. And so, Lord, we just thank you for your presence here this morning. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Mindset. So, in short, I just want to share with you quickly um, kind of just a very brief synopsis of what the first message was about. Um, in our chaotic world that we live in, there's, there's very few things that we have control over. Would you agree? There's very few things that we have control over, but there is one thing that we have control over. It's ourselves, our, our soul. We, we have control of what goes on inside of us. And you might say, well, no, actually I don't because there's so much going on around me. I, I just react. Well, that's kind of a mindset thing, okay? If, if you react because of your circumstances, then you're reacting because of the wrong reason. You need a better mindset. 
And your soul is basically uh, made up of three different parts. It's your mind, and then you have your will, and then you have your emotions. And if we can resolve in our mind to put God first, and if we respond by, by choosing his will over our will, then our emotions are going to have a, we're going to have a better outcome when it comes to our emotions because you're going to respond in a godly way. You're going to respond in a way that honors him. And also it's going to show the world who God is because they are going to respond differently because, you know what, normally when, when somebody irritates you, the normal worldly response is what? Payback. Right? Guy driving behind you, right on your tail, irritating you, what do you do? Do you speed up or slow down? You slow down. Why? Because it's just a human thing. You know what? You're going to bug me, I'm going to bug you right back. But you see, God wants us to live a different way. He wants us to have a different mindset. And so our minds are powerful, and that's why we have to have these good mindsets in order for us to govern ourselves and be valuable in our relationship with God, because God desires us to do His will. He desires us to do what He has called us to do. And if we want to do that and do that effectively, we, we do need to have the proper mindset to do that. And so that's where these, these sermons out of the book of Daniel are coming from. So we're going to look at another one here today. And it's this mindset of expectation. I would say that my, uh, your expectations are really, uh, really powerful things. We all face expectations from spouses, right? Maybe there's expectations from your children or, or maybe from your parents if you're a young person, right? You, you have expectations and, and some expectations are really good. They, they propel you to be better. They propel those under you or the over you to, to get more out of you or you get more out of them. But, but have you ever felt like there were some really unrealistic expectations upon you? Or maybe you felt at times, maybe I have, I have placed unrealistic expectations on somebody else. And the reality is, is that expectations are so powerful, but, but yet if directed in the wrong way, they can be very disappointing to you. See, if you expect something that's unrealistic and that person fails you, you feel disappointed. We feel like we have failed them in many ways, but, but they've really just failed you. And you, you're like, what happened? They failed me. You know, we end up being disappointed because it's part of our human nature to to make mistakes, right? It's part of our human nature to, to screw up, right? We, we make mistakes all the time. And let's be honest, if you haven't made a mistake this morning, then maybe you just rolled out of bed, right? Because we make mistakes constantly. And the fact of the matter is, is that expectations, unrealistic ones, do not help us or anyone else. And so that's where we're, we're kind of going here this morning, that our mindset of expectation should be on God, not on others and not on ourselves. Expectations affect outcomes. We're going to read out of Daniel chapter 2. We're going to go through the whole chapter, so I am going to try to move quickly. So uh, I do have the slides for you on the screen. But if you want to look it up in your own uh, Bible, I would encourage you to do that as well. Daniel chapter 2, 1 through 13 is where we're going we're gonna to start this first section. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have a dream that troubles me. I want to know what it means. I'm going to pause there for just one second. Those are some pretty high expectations, wouldn't you say? 
that, that the king would ask these group of men to tell them what his dream is. I don't know about you, but if you've ever had a dream and you go to your, you know, kids maybe had a dream or something and say, hold on, you had a dream? Let me think. Let me think what that dream was. I mean, that seems like an impossible task, right? You, you would be able to say, well, tell me your dream and then I'll be able to interpret it for you. Tell me the dream and I can maybe help you make sense of it. Well, these people didn't get that opportunity. This is a very tall task, unrealistic in his expectations, is King Nebuchadnezzar here. So let me continue on in verse 4. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. See what I mean? Verse 5, the king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me my dream, <clears throat> what my dream was, and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your house turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Verse 8, then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time. Because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is no, sorry, there is one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. And in verse 10, the astrologers, I'm behind you, sorry. Verse 10, the astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. The king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to the wise men to be put to death, and, the, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. I'm going to stop there for a moment. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had made up his mind that he was tired of these wise men, astrologers, magicians, all these guys tricking him. So maybe in the past something has happened. Maybe in the past he shared with them what his dream was and they'd interpreted it and it was totally wrong. Maybe. It doesn't say that. But maybe this is why he's so frustrated. He's tired with these men tricking him. And in the process, these magicians and astrologers and so on, they... They are trying to bide some time. You see, if I told you to interpret my dream, but you have to tell me what the dream is first, do you think you'd be buying some time? Especially if I sent out the order that I was going to kill you. If, I, if, I, if I'm going to kill you because you can't tell me my dream, that's, that's a pretty scary thing. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was a vicious, angry person. He didn't care he just wanted his way. He wanted it his way, and he wanted it done as soon as possible because he was the ruler of the known world. He was the ruler of the known world. King Nebuchadnezzar had set the expectations on these men so high that they could not do what the king had asked. And out of fear for their lives, they continued to stall. And even in verse 10, they say, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. King Nebuchadnezzar, in his disappointment, lashes out in rage. You see how unrealistic expectations caused his emotions to go way off kilter. So much so that he was enraged to the point of he was going to kill them all, as if all of the wise men needed to be killed. Right? They didn't all need to be killed. 
But he didn't care. He was like, I'm going to take care of them all. They can't tell me? Forget it. And you see this, this execution, this death sentence was for Daniel and his friends too. You see, our expectations affect outcomes. When we expect too much, the outcome often leads to disappointment. You see, it's here where we see Daniel enter the narrative and he gives us a whole different approach to expectations. We need to place our expectations on God. Joyce Meyer here in this quote says, Put your expectations on God, not on people. Wise lady. Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 14. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. See, Daniel was a smart, smart man. He knew the Lord. He knew God, and, and God had already blessed Daniel and his friends just earlier in chapter two, or in chapter one, rather. It says in chapter one, verse 17 and verse 20, to these four men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. Daniel and his pals just went through this this scene in chapter 1 where where they, they wouldn't defile themselves and eat the king's food. And God blesses them. God gives them wisdom. God gives them knowledge and understanding because they trusted him. They trusted God. I wonder sometimes if if Daniel knew this, this verse found in Psalms 119, verse 98 and 99. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. You know, Daniel meditated on God. Daniel spent time with God, and God blessed him with wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Super cool. Super cool. Verse 15. He asked the king's officer, so this is Daniel. Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for what? He asked for time. Kind of the same thing that the astrologers and all these guys were asking for, but they just kept kind of stalling instead of asking. So out of respect, Daniel asks the king for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. And in verse 17, Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for the mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the men of Babylon. What a difference in expectation from Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. Daniel treats this situation completely different. Right away, Daniel placed his expectations on God. Daniel knew who could help him. God could help him. No one else can interpret this but God. Daniel and his friends were facing the same death penalty as all the others. What What particularly set Daniel apart from others? It was simply his trust in God. Daniel knew that he could trust God to provide. As I said earlier in chapter 1, Daniel just learned the lesson of trusting God when it comes to being given only vegetables and water to eat. And he looked ten times better than all the others. You see, Daniel was in a life and death situation I'm not sure any of you in this room have been in a life and death situation. If you have, don't raise your hand. Because we don't want to have to question you. (laughs) 
See, even in our greatest difficulties, God is still faithful to His Word. Hello? Yeah. Even in our greatest difficulties, God is still faithful to His Word. God's plans will always revolve around His purposes, not yours. God's plans revolve around His purposes and not yours, and He will be faithful to them. God is going to be faithful to His purposes. And you see, the great part about all of this is that God wants us to be part of His purposes in this world. Here, Daniel is being used by God to fulfill the purposes in Babylon. Daniel is demonstrating that our expectations need to be on God and not on ourselves. When Daniel placed his expectations on God, he chose to depend solely on God. So we need to depend on him. Depend on God. Verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Yes, praise God. You see, Daniel's dependence on God resulted in him having the mystery revealed in a vision. All this took place because Daniel chose to seek God last. No, right? No. He chose to seek God first. Somebody's paying attention. This is good. Right? God chose to bless Daniel and give him the vision that he was asking for. Essentially, this vision was a notice to King Nebuchadnezzar that you are not going to be in control. You are not in control. God is in control. And guess what? You're not going to be killing us. Was there arrogance there? Perhaps not, right? Perhaps, and hopefully there was no arrogance in Daniel, but I can only kind of sense that he is really proud of this moment They prayed because they were depending on God to reveal the mystery. You see, our dependence is shown when we pray. You see, when we pray, our dependence on God is shown. You know, if if you are going to be a person of prayer, then then you are also a person who depends on God. It's, It's not about you and your will. It's about His will in his way, his purposes. But when we pray, we submit to him and say, you know what, I don't have the answers, but but God, you do. I don't know what to do, but, but God, you do know. And Daniel was in this position. He was in this position where he had no idea what to do. So he prayed. He asked for time to pray and seek God to give him the Mystery, to to reveal the mystery to him and his friends. You see, when we depend on ourselves, we're only setting ourselves up for disappointment. Unrealistic expectations we place on ourselves only lead to disappointment. I like this illustration. Hey, show the new guy around here our company nerve center. Clue him in on our ridiculous expectations. Now, have you, have you ever had ridiculous expectations set upon you in your job or, you know? So, sometimes they can seem really not that important, but, but it's like this saying, like, just, just go tell them what, you know, how ridiculous this is, right? I just found it funny. If you don't find it funny, that's good, that's good, that's good. Okay, so uh, what are some unrealistic expectations that you have? You know, what are, what are some of the things that you, you have placed on people that are unrealistic, that you really shouldn't burden them with? You know, you, you, that you really shouldn't put all of this weight on people. Maybe, maybe you've, you've set up expectations of yourself that, that you just can't even do. Right? You just can't even compete, even, even with the things that that you've set upon yourselves. So honestly, you need to deal with them and turn those expectations over to God. 
You see, the magicians, sorcerers, and astrologers knew no one on earth can. And you know what? They were right. No one on earth could. No one on earth could reveal the mystery to King Nebuchadnezzar, but God could. And guys, girls, I love this. I really like how the astrologers say in verse 11, no one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they do not live among humans. There was one who did live among humans. Just not yet. Jesus, who is God, lived among humans. He is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And and He is the one who is going to rule in the end. He is going to sit on the throne and rule over the whole earth. He wins. So we see here, Daniel, here he places his expectations on God, gets revelation from God, and responds in worship. Verse 19 says this, Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. You see, I find it interesting here that before Daniel shared the revelation he received, he praised God. Daniel was living for the glory of God. Daniel didn't want to receive any glory for himself. He didn't want to receive any glory for himself. He was humble. Let's hear what Daniel said as he praised God. Praise to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He disposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God, for of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you, and you have made known to us the dream of the king. Daniel had the mindset that we ought to have. First, we need to expect from God. Place your expectations on Him. Wait for God to give you the revelation. Wait on God to give you what you are asking for. And it's not about waiting till He gives you what you ask for in the sense of... But, but in, this, in Daniel's case, he's, he's asking God to reveal a mystery... Have you ever had a mystery in your life? Something that doesn't make sense? You know? And we, we'd love revelation. Why, why is this happening? You know, we ask that question all the time. Even, even during COVID, we're, we're asking this question even more. Like, why is all this happening? What does this all mean? What's going to be the end result? How long is this going to last? It's a mystery. It really is. And maybe in your life there's mysteries that you don't understand. But you see here, when Daniel receives this uh, revelation, he responds to God in worship. Don't respond in ignorance like somehow you were better than anyone else who've received this revelation from God. We sometimes see this in people. That they, they hear a word from God and all of a sudden it's like, I'm this super important person that heard from God. No, you're really not. You're really not this super important person that heard from God. You're, you're just another person. God's just chose to use you. God's just chose to, to encourage you, to bless you, to, to reveal something to you for you. Or maybe it's not for you. Maybe it is for somebody else. But here's the thing. Humble yourself. Go praise God. Thank you, Lord, for revealing this to me. You see, before Daniel even acted out, he worshipped. Before Daniel acted out, he worshipped. You see, when we live with our expectations on God, our dependence is on Him, then we get to be His mouthpieces speaking into a situation with hope and truth. 
Expectation in God is powerful, and that's not how my slide was meant to look, silly fonts. Sorry. (laughs) Daniel chapter 2, verse 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and he said to them, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king and at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And verse 27, Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. Daniel is proud that he knows that his God is able to do something no one else can do. You can hear it. He's proud that God is still God, that God is still able to do all of these things that people can't do. And then he says in verse 28, But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. He's there. He's, he's, his confidence is in God and he uses his voice to speak, even reminding the king that it's only God that can do it. In verse 29, as your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to the things to come and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. This is, this is the point where Daniel is showing this humility, which, you know what, we need to see more of in our own lives. You see, humility is a great trait that is found in many great men and women of God, knowing that it is God who works through us to achieve His plans and His purposes. It's not my strength, it's His strength. Verse 31, your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out. Not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. I'm going to pause there for just a second. Do you you wonder with me whether at this point as they're sharing, whether King Nebuchadnezzar's head's getting a bit big? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But Daniel's saying like, you are this great and awesome man, right? Ruler over the whole known world. Really? Oh, cool. You know? I don't know. I don't know. But I... I think that 
he was troubled in his dream. This interpretation obviously is coming out of Daniel, and I don't know if he's thinking like that. But as I read that, I thought, I wonder if. I wonder if he's, he's kind of, you know, puffed up. Because he was arrogant. There's no doubt about that. He would have been proud, for sure. Anyways. Verse 39. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw the feet and toes were partly baked of, of clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it. Even as you saw iron mixed with clay, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixed with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain. Not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. See, for the sake of time this morning, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about the statue, the dream. But I do want to point out a couple quick things. There is a great significance in this dream as King Nebuchadnezzar was the gold, the head of the statue. And from there, we, we see that the metals are, are basically decreasing in value with each empire that followed. So much has been made, though, of these, these other empires that have come along. But each one has decreased in value. And, and even, you know, currently we, we, we probably boast mostly about the, the Roman Empire because we read so much about it in, in the Word, right, in the New Testament and so on. We see this empire that has risen up, and it's, and it's one of the iron. It's just, it's, it's hard. It, it just suppresses and all of this stuff, right? And, and these things have happened. But the reality is that Daniel shares this dream with the king, and we see throughout history that these events came to pass. That one by one, these, these empires came to pass. And I really just want to point to something that is really important what the Bible says happens. What the Bible says happens. God speaks to the king through his dream. Daniel interprets the dream and these things happened. So what is written in the word of God will actually take place. Have you thought about that? That what's written in the word of God is going to take place. All of it. All of it. There's not a detail missed. Go back through the history books. Not a detail is missed in those empires that have gone before. Not a detail. And there are many more details left to be written even out of that prophetic word, of, of that vision. Right? The stone that is going to strike the statue is God. God is going to strike the statue and all of those other kingdoms are going to fall. All these other kingdoms are going to come crashing down and there's only going to be one kingdom left remaining. And that's the kingdom of God. And at the end of all of this, there's only one kingdom that is going to stand. It is the one that is left, the enduring kingdom of God. Wow. 
what God says is actually going to happen. Even here in the book of Daniel, God shows that he is in complete control and his purposes will come to pass. Daniel finishes the interpretation as he says, the great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation trustworthy. Verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering of incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. As we wind up this morning, as we kind of bring this whole thing to a close, we we end up at the end of chapter 2. King Nebuchadnezzar has acknowledged Daniel's God. But do you notice that, that King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't worship God? He doesn't worship God. Have you ever had something so amazing revealed to you and you didn't worship God? Has God ever shared something with you that was so amazing, so life-changing, but it didn't change you? Nebuchadnezzar was that man. This dream that troubled him kept him up at night. He finally knew what it meant. But he didn't worship God. He, he worshiped Daniel. He basically worships Daniel. He, he understands that it's Daniel's God, but he lavishes upon these guys. He gives them all kinds of gifts. Oh. You see, Daniel... Daniel trusted and depended on God. And Nebuchadnezzar trusted and depended on himself and his wise men. What a contradiction. What what an opposition of a mindset. They had totally different view. What is your view? Do Do you tend to depend completely on yourself? Maybe maybe you depend and and have these unrealistic expectations of not only yourself, but everyone around you. That everybody else is supposed to make you happy, maybe. Maybe everyone else is supposed to, you know, rub your back and make you feel good. But you see, they're going to disappoint you. People are going to disappoint you. I am probably going to disappoint you at some point. But God the revealer of mysteries, the one who can reveal all kinds of revelation to you. When it happens, are you a person that praises God like Daniel or are you one to kind of shrink back and just go, well, okay, that was kind of cool. Respond in worship and then do whatever it is that God has asked you to do. Daniel didn't hesitate. He went straight back to Arioch and said, I must talk to the king. Do not put these wise men to death. I can interpret the dream. Had he delayed, men would have died. Right? But he didn't delay. He didn't delay. You see, placing our expectations on God rather than others is what we need to do and depend on him. Because I want to tell you something, God wants to use you in a powerful way. I think we, we don't expect enough from God. We think God's this little God when he's this massive God. And he wants to use you today. He wants to use you today in your world, in the situation that you live in. Let's pray.
Holy Spirit, there's none like you. There's none like you because you are the one that can reveal mysteries. You are the one who could share with us and speak with us. Show us things that no man could know. Lord, thank you for for saving me. Thank you for for sending your your son Jesus and, and saving me. I don't deserve it, but you did it. Lord, I thank you that as we place our expectations on you, God, may we not uh, just have limited expectations, but we would, we would grow in our expectation of what you can do. Lord, there are no restrictions when it comes to you. Lord, there are no restrictions when it comes to you. There's no social distancing when it comes to you. We can get as close to you as we want. Lord, would you draw near to us? May we place our expectations. May we depend on you and you alone. And may we see your power displayed in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for revealing yourself to me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being my God. Lord, may we take you to every corner of this world and make you famous. Daniel honored and glorified you in everything he did. May we be people like Daniel and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good. God bless you. Have an amazing day. Um, There is no evening service tonight. Because it's the long weekend. So enjoy the enjoy the weekend with your family and your friends. God bless. Thank you.